Tonight, we're featuring the work of Wes Taylor, and I heard him speak at Media Week last week. He's, he's a friend of Bethany's. He's helped and worked with our media arts department. He's helped with our film festival. He sent some filmmakers over to us for various red-eye uh, competitions, and so he's well known by our, our media arts department and many of our students. Um, his, his work tonight he calls light painting, which should be interesting to find out about how he does it. He has a BFA in photography from Utah State University. He has a master's degree in <laughs> institutional <laughs> instructional design, from, also from Utah State University, and he has a master's of art in photography from Mankato State University. I'm sure he will be happy to answer questions. Um, afterwards, if the students could help us move the chairs aside, we'll have, we have a reception with some food. Uh, he'll be happy to talk to you personally, and he's going to show us how he does these magic photographs. Please welcome Wes Taylor. Thank you, Bill. They all said that it's going to be ludicrous afterwards. So, oh, I've had it once. Once was enough. I like I like that stuff. Yeah. Especially the stuff you put on this. That's that's yeah. ludicrous. I don't know what you put on ludicrous. Butter. Lots of butter. Lots, lots of butter. <laughs> Hold the nose. Is that what you're saying? Okay. I'll have to do that. The uh, before I start, I'd like to. Um, uh, thank Bill and the art department here uh, for letting me come. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like also to thank the media arts folks for putting up with me. And I'd also like to thank uh, South Central and uh, faculty, staff, administrators even, and uh, students for putting up with me as well. Uh, the one that puts up with me the most is my good wife, Lisa. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Today, even that's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, I deserve it though. It's fun. The um, art. Um, uh, most people like to know who who the fellow is, right? <coughs> so when they drained the swamp, they found me. No, uh, I, I grew up, born and raised in South Carolina. They talk funny then. <laughs> I was born on Friday the 5th, December it was. Florence Memorial Hospital. And the way my mama says it, they were having the Christmas parade outside when I was born. Don't know if that has anything to do with anything, but, but the story is still told. Okay, that was a Christmas parade baby. The, uh, obviously, Santa Claus was good to me every year after that, so that was good. But I was a December baby, so what's that mean? Christmas and your birthday gift are together, right? I was actually wedded to my lovely wife in December, so what does that mean? I either get really big presents or I get nothing. All right. So that's okay. But my backyard was a swamp. And in that swamp, my brother and I had a ball. It was awesome. We played with everything. The snakes, the possums, the foxes, and the alligators. Don't worry, this one's safe. This is a styrofoam one that you can buy on Amazon right now for $39.99. <laughs> Prime, it'll get to you in two days. But like that green eye, you know? I'm sure they must have photoshopped that in, I don't know. Uh, this was in, 1968, I was the ripe old age of 10 years old. And uh, I got to see, I, so I was in Darlington, South Carolina. Any NASCAR fans here? Oh, a little, not even a clap. Any NASCAR <laughs> fans here? <laughs> I don't know. I'm a redneck, I'm a NASCAR fan. You know. <laughs> but that uh, uh, was the 500. It used to be the 400. And I lived a mile, mile and a half from the racetrack. And when they would race, we could hear the rrrm, rrrm. And uh, as a Boy Scout, as a Boy Scout, and uh, we got to get in free. 
that's Carl, that's the Boy Scout they used to let the Boy Scouts get in for free. And I got to see Richard Petty go up against the wall. It was awesome. So anyway, that's my claim to fame. And then when I was in junior high, my mom and dad, my dad used to be a barber. Hence, you see over here, you've got these razors, barber razors. So my dad was a barber. He was the youngest barber licensed at 16 in South Carolina. Uh, he was actually cutting hair when he was 12. He was shining shoes when he was four. Uh, my grandfather was a barber. Those were their razors, okay? So if you see a lot of stuff here, ask questions. Most of these have something that means something to me, okay? The, uh, but anyway, barbering up. Bill plays in a band, hard rock. He says he likes to sing the Beatles. They killed my dad. My dad was a what? He was a barber. Right? What do Beatles have? That, that, that I don't have anymore. Hair. They have long hair, right? And so, the barbering business went from, now in the South, now South, when you go to church, you got to look good, right? And so you get your hair cut on Friday or Saturday, get trimmed up. And, uh, and my dad was a little kid. When he was shining shoes, when he was uh, five, six, eight, on Saturday night, he didn't get to bed till three in the morning. They don't do this anymore. But people would go to the midnight show, and after the midnight show, they would take their dates to the barbershop so they could get a haircut and a shave for Sunday. That's weird. Those days are gone. All right, 12 o'clock, you're looking for a pizza place. But anyway, um, the uh, long hair came in, so my dad quit barbering. Long tradition of barbering my family. Most of my aunts were all beauticians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I have fond memories of growing up in a barbershop myself. Uh, lots of cigar smoke, pipe smoke, cigarette smoke. This was the South, right? The tobacco warehouse was only a block away from our place. So yeah, that's the way it was. So tradition was changed. I think this was a momentous part of my life, is because after junior high, my life was always changing. I moved almost every year and a half of my life up until I was what, Lisa? 30? Okay. And so I was in two junior highs, three high schools, and I only went to high school for three years. So we moved to Kingman, Arizona. Does that look like a swampland to you? No, this is pretty bad. Anybody been to Kingman? They got some good mountain bike trails there. That's about it. Okay. All right. Uh, I lived at the El Trovator Hotel. This is Route 66, right? The old Route 66. This, I lived right on Route 66, which is pretty cool. Then we moved to Battle Mountain, Nevada. Huh. Wall Street Journal in 2001 voted this the armpit of America. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll notice it has a B, Battle Mountain. It has a BM on the hill. We'll leave it at that. Okay. Uh, we were only there for a few months. My dad said, enough is enough. We're going to go to Blythe, California. Blythe is actually named very well. Blythe. If someone says, that's really Blythe, that's Blythe, right? And so once again, it was a desert. No swamps, no rattlesnakes, no moccasins, no copperheads, no alligators. But they did have the Colorado River, which was awesome. And so uh, that's where I learned to ski. That was also where I learned how to... I was in Boy Scouts, right? Our Boy Scouts, Boy Scout troops were terrible. Terrible. And uh, I had a Boy Scout master. Every Wednesday night, we would go work on his doom buggies. So he would take Volkswagens, Volkswagen bugs, he would cut 18 inches out of the middle and slam them together. I'm really good at that. That's it. That's all I know. There was no merit badge for making doom buggies, but that's okay. But that was fun. And then I got the opportunity to go on a church mission from my church. I didn't get to go to Africa. I didn't get to go to South America. I got to go to Switzerland. What? I got to go to Switzerland so I could understand my Lutheran friends. All right? Because half the population is either Lutheran or Catholic, right? I also served in southern uh, Germany. And I speak Swiss German, which has nothing to do with German. Does anybody here speak Swiss German? Oh, OK. Does anybody here speak German? Yeah. Ich habe schon gegessen. I have already eaten, right? Ich habe schon gegessen. In Switzerland, they say, Ich habe schon gegessen. So when I got off the train, I go, I'm in, I'm in Italy. I don't know where I'm at. No. 
I was in beautiful Switzerland. Have you noticed that things are looking up for me? I was at the BM, Blythe, and now I'm in Switzerland. It's awesome. And that's when I fell in love with photography. You were wondering when photography was going to come into this, come into this. Um, this camera changed my life. This camera was stolen five years later, but this camera changed my life. <laughs> so, this is the Rolly 35. It had a Schneider lens. It's a Tesla, but it's a Schneider lens. And oh, man, he makes slides. Remember slides? Oh, oh slides. Ectochrome, Kodachrome. Baby, don't take my Kodachrome away. Right, Bill? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, but no, I knew I was on to something. I was 19 years old, you know, wet behind the ears, and somebody said, hey, you need to get this as your camera. I said, all right, cool. So I started making pictures, it's great. All of a sudden, all the people I was in contact with, all the other people that were in my church, were saying, hey, Wes, can I make copies? Can I make copies? Pretty soon, I was making tons of copies, right? And pretty soon, I was getting broke, right? I said, you gotta pay me now. That's when I started making money as a photographer, so this was good. And uh, so when I got back home, I pursued photography as a passion of passion, not as a career. I changed my major five times, and I worked doing all sorts of strange things. Uh, I worked in the morning as a produce manager for a grocery store in St. George, Utah. And uh, in the evenings, I was a lifeguard. <laughs> That is me. <laughs> I used to have hair. I used to have girlfriends. <laughs> well, I, I do have a girlfriend. I've been, I've been told I have a girlfriend. Uh, now, I, that was bored. I was bored with the lifeguard thing, and I decided the next year I was going to fight forest fires. So I did that for a couple of years. This is not my group. My group did not look that good. <laughs> But I did learn a lot about fighting fires. That's kind of fun. The, uh, now, back to college, back to college. Changed my major five times. I did graduate in five years. What did that mean? It means I was double, double dipping. I was taking classes in all sorts of different majors, and people didn't know what my major was. So I first started off in biology, because I just like stuff, right? Biology 101 was great. Any biologist here? Raise your hand. Okay, so you love biology 101, right? And then you get into third, fourth year, fifth year, you're like, man, this isn't easy anymore, right? <laughs> this is a lot of work. So, so I decided to go into horticulture. You know, I saw the movie and I said, hey, see more? I said, yeah, horticulture. So I'm going to be a horticulturist. And then someone said, well, well, you really should be an agribusiness lawyer. I said, what, because I talk so much and that don't make any sense? No, you should be an American business lawyer. I said, all right. So, after two semesters in the law school library, I decided I was numb. Has anybody read law books? Anybody? It's oh, numbing, numbing. No, mm -hmm. said, no we're not going to do that. Let's go do something exciting. Let's go do broadcasting. Yeah, 80 yards, yeah, yeah. Yes. Broadcasting. And uh, I love broadcasting. I was a cameraman, I was a producer, da 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 and I was frustrated half the time because I was on a team of five to eight people and someone was going to mess up. <laughs> <laughs> it was, everything's perfect. It was like, camera three, yeah, camera three. Where are you, camera three? What are you smoking? <laughs> yeah. uh, I stay on camera two until camera three wakes up. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so I got out of that. So my wife, my wife decided my future. Because I, you know me, I was just, I was, I was a wreck. I was a middle wreck. I said, what am I do? And my wife says, hey, guess what? You're a pretty hot photographer. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, all right, all right. And at the time, it was all analog. It was film. And if you are technical and creative at the same time, you can make a really good living as a commercial photographer. Right? I mean, you didn't have digital. I mean, you took the photograph, you either got it or you didn't. And there wasn't much you could do in the dark room to save your butt. Now we have Photoshop that saves your butt all the time, all the time, right? 
Good thing we're shooting raw, right? Got to shoot raw so it saves your butt. <laughs> so, I did photography. Thanks to my good wife, she did make me graduate. I had, uh, I had three, two classes left, something like that, and I got a job with Steve Triagle, who, by the way, is still a photographer, I found out today. At least I went and saw that find something on Steve. He is still shooting at 72 years old and doing well. I'm sitting there going, why don't you retire? I, I, I got a call to find out. But I think the reason why he's probably still working is because that's what he loves. He is obsessed with photography. And I'm going to talk about that tonight a little bit. Uh, most of my talk today is going to be towards the students. Uh, and one of the things is this. If you're not obsessed about something in a good way, be obsessed about something in a good way, uh, then you're not speaking my language. Okay, you and I won't be able to communicate too terribly well. That's true, Mitch, isn't it? Yeah. And I'm obsessed with photography. I'm obsessed with a lot of other things like chocolate. I'm obsessed with my wife. And uh, it's, it's all good. It's all good. But I worked for him for a few years. Not a few, excuse me, a few months. And then I got a call. Oh, this is a little story for you students who say, Shank, there's no jobs, there's no jobs. I can't, oh, blah, blah, blah. Even when I was going to school, they were saying there were no jobs. Does that make sense? And I said, I don't care. I'm going to be the best that I can be. Okay, NBA basketball freaks here. Okay, how many how many people are actually in the NBA that are playing? About 400, right? How many people are in the United States? What's the percentage of people in the United States who actually are good enough to be on an NBA team? They are obsessed about basketball. They're really good at basketball. Some of them are good at some other stuff, but most of them aren't really good at anything else except basketball. But, you know, they're good at basketball, right? And they're making a really good living as long as they keep their knees, right? And their legs and other body parts, you know. But they're obsessed. Uh, who's the guy? Was it uh, Kobe? 18. Did he get drafted when he was 18? Okay. 18. Was it the last two games? He missed a whole bunch of free throws and lost games, and it was a mess, right? And he was sitting there at 18 going, oh man, I don't know if I'm going to make it, right? How many free throw shots did he do that summer? Over a million. He was obsessed. And he, he's retired now, and he's one of the Hall of Famers, right? It's awesome stuff. So, be obsessed. I was obsessed enough. My wife was working. She had to have the car. We lived in Logan, Utah. Salt Lake City was an hour and a half away. I had to get there. There was no such thing as the internet. We barely had phones, people, all right? And I had a friend who had a bread truck route. And he said, I've got to go show my portfolio in Salt Lake. Can I hitch a ride with you? So 5 o'clock in the morning, I hitched a ride with the bread truck guy. Bed truck. Bread truck guy. How's that sound? And um, so there I was with my portfolio in hand in front of with this guy in the bread truck. He dropped me off downtown Salt Lake, and he says, I'll pick you up in five, man. I said, all right. So I went around, and I showed my portfolio of cold calling people. I hit about 15 places. And within a week, I had a job at Triangle, and then three months later, um, uh, in fact, my church, who actually had a huge media department, and only had three staff photographers, they called me and said, hey, would you be a, one of our staff photographers? Uh, I talked to Steve Triagle and I said, dude, I, I, I really like working for you. I should, I should just stay here. And Steve said, hey, all the best photographers in the world, especially in Utah, want to work for the LBS Church. You'll make good money, good benefits, you will shoot your head off. Okay? I shot over 100 rolls of film every week. Okay? Uh, we did posters, we did, okay. so this is some of them, when I was the ripe old age of 25. The, uh, I got tired of that, and I decided to go get blown up in a rocket. It's fun. So I worked for Morton Fikal, and what they were, were an aerospace engineering facility, and they did the space shuttle. And I worked there for several years. I uh, got to see a lot of launches. Got to take photographs and high-speed video and high-speed film of all of this. So that was kind of fun. Uh, you see those big, these big boosters right here? Uh, you know model rockets? 
you know, little kids stuff. You know, they have a hole in the in the entrance, this little hole. These have little holes. Except the hole is like eight feet in diameter. And so me and engineers would crawl into these rockets filled with propellant and take photographs with the stroke. And we would have Tyvek suits on, and we would have our static cords on, and we'd hope we wouldn't blow ourselves up. It did happen. Uh, the two and a half, three years I was there, uh, 15 people were killed. And 12 of them were killed uh, from actually rockets exploding, which was really kind of sad. Then, I got my master's in instructional design. Uh, I was working for people taking photographs and video of instructional materials, and I asked them, hey, how do you do that? They said, hey, go to Utah State, just down the road, and they're one of the three top schools in the nation right now for instructional design. By the way, they still are. And um, I got my degree. My first job was at the University of Northern Iowa, down in Cedar Falls, Waterloo area, right? Panthers, go Panthers, right? Worked there for a few years. Then I hit Scott all the way across country and went back to Idaho. Idaho State University, home of the Bengals, right? And I worked there for a few years as an instructional designer and started a whole instructional design unit there. Remodeled the whole basement of their library. It was fun. We put in labs and we put in all sorts of good stuff. And then um, I came to South Central College uh, as their dean of technology. The black squirrels. They know oh, look, look, look at this. Panthers. Arr. Bengals. Arr. Squirrels. <laughs> I love it. Arr. Arr. <laughs> uh, but it's been fun. And so the last six years, I was I had a great opportunity uh, to land a great job there, and that was as a full-time faculty member. Uh, teaching video production and photography. It's been awesome. Had some great students, they've been winning state and national championships. They've actually been getting real jobs in the area. It's amazing. <laughs> they can afford homes. It's amazing. The, um, uh, this is kind of my life as a mess. Okay? Um, used to be a Boy Scout master. This is them towing me in the, in the water, trying to drown me. <laughs> I, I used to be the Rotary president here in town. That was fun. Uh, oh, this, I, I started mountain biking big time in the last few years. So I went up to Cuyuna and entered a mountain bike race. I was shocked. I came in 19th out of 60. Second in my age group. That's awesome. I paid everybody off. It was great. <laughs> I like to work on cars. Um, I had a pituitary gland tumor uh, about eight years ago. Uh, three years ago, I had a really bad bike accident where I lost my spleen, three quarts of my blood, broke my left elbow, and almost died. <laughs> my wife was going to be rich. <laughs> <laughs> she still wakes up in the morning. You should have died. <laughs> die, die, die. I've run the St. George Marathon in Utah. I've ran the St. George Marathon three times. Beautiful. The great thing about that one is all downhill. Not super down, but a little down. It's great stuff. Okay. Doesn't seem like 26.2 miles. It's, you know, it seems like 24. Anyway. Okay. Uh, this one is dear to my heart. So Monday through Friday, uh, 6.30 to 7.30, I get the opportunity to spend time with the youth of our church doing Bible study. Uh, they wake up early in the morning. They come listen to me. It's a real problem. But I bake them cookies. And chocolate is what makes the world go round. The uh, light painting makes the world go round too. Okay. The uh, so I've always known about light painting, and most people when they talk about photography and light painting, they think about doing some art blurs. And, and this is a process where they actually take a whisk, a metal whisk, and they throw. Uh, steel wool, fine steel wool in it, they light it on fire, and they spin it around, and they burn their clothes, and they burn the grass, and they burn the town down. <laughs> My son, Jeremiah King, who actually graduated from here, when they were younger, in Faribault, they were doing this in one of the city parks, and Jeremiah's brother worked on the fire department. He calls Jeremiah up. He says, hey dude, I know this is you, 
But we're coming out to look at a fire hazard at the city park. I know it's you. Get out of there. And they were doing this. <laughs> Jeremy goes, how do you know it was me? Only you would be doing this in the city park. So I <laughs> But light paintings, pretty much, you know, squigglage, you know, you do fancy things with little lights, and it's great. You know, even little kids. Hey, light painting's fun, because a lot of my students, we do light painting in our first photography class. After we do this, I say, anybody got kids? Ooh. Anybody have nieces and nephews? Ooh. Okay, good. Show them how to do light painting. And they love it. Kids, little kids love this stuff. The, uh, sometimes you get something that's kind of cool looking. Okay, yeah, it's cool. Now, for me, it was just kind of like, yeah, whatever. Light painting, yeah, whatever. You know, it doesn't even interest me, all right? And then I saw Eric Curry. He's a guy from California, and he does light paintings of all sorts. He does big stuff. Airplanes, tanks, trains, just really cool stuff. And I looked at his stuff and went, that's really cool. And he's got some videos out there. Look at them. You know, uh, I'll show you one that's got like 40 layers. He does things like 60, 70 layers. The guy's insane. Okay. And then I saw Harold Ross. Oh my gosh. This guy does beautiful, beautiful work. Okay. And I said, wow, this is awesome. I think I can try and do light painting. That was kind of fun. And so, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Now, think about this. He lit every one of those grapes separately. And then Photoshop and just, that's just beautiful. That's beautiful. And so that's my grapes, all right? It's a spud drive in, Driggs, Idaho. And uh, look, they've got a little truck here. It's the Mater, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they have this spud truck in the Mater. And uh, this was at night, you know, the, the tail lights are here. This is at the end of the show, okay? Actually, I did. The whole theater. I did. I went inside and did light paintings, you know, all sorts of stuff. But that light painting, I actually used strobes. So I took strobes and I strobed the outside of it. I thought that was kind of cool. You know? yeah. And then uh, this is an old bridge down in Illinois. It's a church site for our church. Uh, they, uh, some pioneers built this like in the 1840s. So I went down with a little mag light. You know, it was fun. And then uh, Betsy Tacy, did I say that right? Yeah. I've never read the books. Anybody read the books? All right, good, good job. Somebody did, all right. But they had this old typewriter in there. I said, cool, can I like paint that? So I went down in their old dungeon basement of that house. Ooh, that's kind of creepy. Me and the spiders. And we like painted this. And I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. I like that. My next door neighbor has a two lane bowling alley. My next door neighbor has a two lane bowling alley in his shed. <laughs> it's amazing. Two lanes return the whole nine yards. He's got all his friends donate bowling balls and shoes. They have a kitchen. They have a living room. They have, it's right all right there. It's a party room for bowling. It's awesome. I can't tell you where it is. But anyway, uh, <laughs> it's really cool. And so he let me light paint this. Now, I'm, I was new and I didn't know what I was doing. I'm thinking about actually re-light painting this. Because I did this in like three photographs. Because I'm scared to death of layers and compositing in Photoshop. Okay, so, uh, then it got a little wild. This was like maybe six layers. And, uh, and then I decided I would actually go to the top of the mountain and go and talk with Harold Ross. So I took a, uh, two years ago this spring, I went to Pennsylvania, middle of nowhere. Uh, he was a commercial photographer in Pittsburgh. And, uh, no, 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 not Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, excuse me. He was in Philadelphia. And uh, he decided that he was going to do light paintings and do fine art and do workshops. So he kind of closed his commercial studio about 10 years ago and just started doing light paintings and workshops. He does a very good job of it. Uh, he has a 5,000 square foot home. His whole basement is a studio. Half of that studio has just old junk in it. In the back there, I've got some old junk. Okay? And some of that old junk is in these photographs. Okay? Uh, Steve, hold up the, the metal ring. Yeah, the big one. Yeah. 
So that's the ring that's in that photograph right to the left of those young men. And uh, yeah, so after, the, after this, go back and look at those and then look at the items and you'll suddenly realize that when you light paint things, the perspective, the ambiance, the entire essence of that object changes big time just because of the light. Okay. The uh, tools. Uh, most of you want to know a little bit about the tools of the trade. I used to use a Mac light, okay? And then uh, I got all, I, I adulted. Is that, is that the new term? Adulted? I adulted. I love it when kids say that. I'm adulting. Oh, okay, right. What am I doing now? I'm 60. I'm getting oldie. I'm oldie. I'm oldie. Uh, a tactical flashlight, okay? Um, any guy, anybody in here bushcrafting, you know, preppers, you know, that type of thing, uh, your tactical flashlight is your best buddy, right? And this is what you need in order to do light hangings, okay? Uh, this is an Olight. Uh, this is another Olight. They don't sell this one anymore. It was 50 bucks. And this one is $50.45 on Amazon. The cool thing about it, it is rechargeable. This is mine, okay? Uh, but the nice thing is that they're really nice and bright. The, um, now, most people, when they go light painting, they, all they do is, uh, Jim, can you stand up for me? All right. Jim's a Korean war vet. He's been around. <laughs> Turn around this one. Most people, when they light paint, they just shine a harsh light on things. See how harsh that light is on Jim? Not very flattering, would you? All right? I understand. Okay. Now, just keep standing, Jim. Keep standing. Keep standing. Got more. Got more. All right. So, good job. Good job. Good job. All right. So, this is nothing more than a bunch of PVC pipe. Okay? And the light comes down, it gets baffled, bounces around, and it comes out. And this light, can you tell it's a lot softer now? Yeah, very nice. Stay there. Okay. okay. <laughs> now, the cool thing about this. All right. All right. Harold Ross is making a killing. He decided that he was going to sell these things for 65 bucks a pair. For two of them. Yeah. Left, right. You know, left one and right one, right? Before I met Harold, I laid my own. I went and bought my own PVC pipe and got some glue for a total of five dollars. I had some old black spray paint, I painted them, there we go, 65 bucks. Ah, that's awesome, okay. Now, these are the ones that Harold makes because when I went to the workshop, he almost gave it to me for free, so that was good. Now, this one's a white wand, I love this. Okay, 110 dollars, oh boy. <laughs> I tried making this four times and failed. If you go inside of this thing, there's one heck of a baffling system in here, and Harold figured it out. And I bought this for 60 bucks. Yeah. What's the difference between this and the light system, by the way? Yeah, this one's nice. This is nice and soft. Look at that. Is that beautiful? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, all, we, we both look good. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, that, that looks really good. I mean, that's nice and soft. Now, if you look at these light paintings, uh, okay, the base. The one with the base. Guess what I use for the base? Ooh. Okay. Uh, let's see. This guy. What do you think I used? I used this guy. Alright. That's how I did that one. Okay. Um, parts, parts of the engine on this were done with this. Um, these razors, half the photographs that I used in this were done like this, okay? So, if you're into light painting, 110 bucks, that's pretty steep, but guess what? It's worth it. It's worth it. Try to make one of these. If you actually fail three times like I did, yeah, you'll buy it. So, there's that. Um, now, one I didn't show, this is like $10. Uh, fiber optic. See that? Just a woo woo, 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 woo. Okay, that's for nothing. 
I hardly ever use this. Matter of fact, none of these photographs actually use this. Okay? But if I was doing something delicate like a diamond ring or something like that, then I would use this. Okay. I should get a diamond ring. <laughs> the wife says, I can buy a diamond ring. I feel better already. All right. Oh, I've got to work another year. I can't retire yet. Actually, she's really good. She's the financier of our, of our, our household. Without her, I would be financially unstable. Um, now this, this is awesome, okay? The cool thing about this is that it is dirt cheap, 31 bucks, okay? Uh, the cool thing about this one, it is tungsten, and then it has a little dial like most things do now, with these LED things. It goes all the way from tungsten to daylight, okay? And anywhere in between. I shoot primarily uh, with this in daylight, okay? Um, the car, uh, the car, uh, about six or seven of the images in that, that were made up in that car were used, I used this. Um, the guitar, the guitar, uh, a few of those, this was in that a little bit too. Um, Oh, my grandma's keys. Uh, you, don't, you probably don't see it. This, this one's got, got keys in there. My grandmother died in 1962. This is in the South. She had, she had a funny accent, too. And uh, it was a plain, white, boarded house. It was the type of house that you went on this little back porch and you went into the kitchen through the back door. And in the back door, she had this little aluminum thing that has an oak leaf and kind of this oak acorny thing. And she kept her keys in there. And she had this cloth in there. We don't know why the cloth was there. Maybe she was retentive and didn't like the little cleaning sounds. I don't know. And uh, I opened that up like in September. I found it in my mom's stuff. And I said, Mom, what's this? Oh, that's for your grandmother. I go, oh, cool. Oh. Do you know we've never unwrapped it? We've never touched it since she died. So since 1962, I shot it just the way it's been since 1962. So that's kind of an error. I think I'm going to make a puzzle out of it and send it to all my relatives. You know, I'm going to do the same thing I think with the, with the razors. Make a puzzle. Make a puzzle. You make puzzles. Now, the other cool thing about this is uh, you can light paint and do buildings and big things and trees and stuff. Uh, really expensive, but uh, paint poles. Uh, there's this little aluminum thing you can buy online now, and it attaches an umbrella swivel. And on that, you can attach a flash, you can attach that light I just showed you. And if you get those really nice paint poles that go up 20 feet, you can get your light up 20 feet. <coughs> and you can paint trees and giants and all sorts of stuff. And I'm short, so it comes in really handy. You know? So that works out really, really well. Okay, so that's kind of on the techie side. Sorry about that. Um, I didn't bring a reflector, a diffuser, because most of you guys who are in photography have that. And then I, I hold it, I actually use the, the, the triangle ones that have the handle. I don't, I didn't bring the other, you know why I didn't bring it? Because I didn't want to steam it anymore. Uh, I have this hanging in my studio. I steam it, so there's no wrinkles in it at all. So when I'm light painting with it, I get no wrinkles. Does that make sense? Also, I'm moving this light around a little bit, and so, like creeks and some of that base. Um, they're just beautiful. Uh, the skate, um, half the one and half this with the uh, with the reflector is kind of cool. Okay. So get into light painting. You know, by the time you're done, you'll spend a couple of hundred dollars. Uh, great card. This is for you students and techies. Um, here's the thing. That this light. If I put it in that PVC, if I put it in uh, the, the wand diffuser, if I actually shine it through a reflector, guess what it does? It changes the color balance every stinking time. But the nice thing about it, it changes the color balance the same every stinking time. So what you do is you color balance your light once. And then in Lightroom and Photoshop, you basically put that preset in there. 
and you say, I have this preset for the, for the light. In fact, I have two of these lights, right? One's a different model. Guess what? It has a different color balance, slightly. So I have a preset for this light, and I have a preset for the other light. I have a preset for this light with, uh, with the PVC pipe, and the other one, I have another preset with the PVC pipe. So you have to be really retentive, because if you've got 40 photographs, and they've all been taken with four, five different things, your color balance is going to be screwy all the way through it. Does that make sense? Ten bucks. Now here's the thing. You can buy a color. How much is a color checker now? Photography students. 70, 80 bucks? Oh, you're a student. You know, go get a go get a can of primer, you know. <laughs> yeah. But no, just ten bucks, get a great card. It is 18% grade and it's beautiful. The um, so that'll work. Okay. So workflow. Um, how does this work? Now, once again, I'm, I'm sorry for you folks who came who really aren't interested in photography, but just like the photographs, right? But this is for the students who are in photography. Um, your workflow is important. You have to be retentive. You have to be exact. You have to be ADHD. You've got to be in sync all the time. If you don't get in sync, you're out of sync and it messes up everything. Okay? You cannot be creative just by being really yelly with this stuff, okay? I shoot and I tether my photos to Lightroom. So I connect my camera up to my computer. So when I take a photograph, it goes to the SD card and it also sends a file to my hard drive. So I have two back, I have two copies of the photograph, right? That's great. So if my camera goes up in flames or my Computer goes up in flames, I've got a copy, right? And then I modify those files in Lightroom. Lightroom has, most of you shoot raw, is that right? Okay. So Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Lightroom, they all have what? A raw what? What do you call it? What? Converter, right? And so I go through all my files, I get them all white balanced, color corrected. Everything's perfect the way I want to. And then I export those files into Photoshop. I do my layer in there in Photoshop. Get it the way I want it, to a degree. And then I take them back to Lightroom. And then do my finishing touches. You know in Lightroom, it's kind of, I, I call it the lazy man's Photoshop, right? But guess what? It saves me so much time. So I go back in, that's when I do my dodging, my burning, my cropping, you know, and that stuff, right? Okay. So, that's my workflow, and I'm going to show you that workflow really fast, okay? So, I'm going to use this photograph as an example, okay? Uh, this is the Rat Rod. Uh, a new friend of mine that I just met two and a half weeks ago, Ron Helms, he's 77 years old, lived in St. George, Utah. He was a drag, strip, racer kind of guy, you know? Uh, he makes these Rat Rods. Uh, he makes one every year, and he sells it for eighty to $100,000, okay? 77 years old, seven years ago when he was 70, he got colon cancer. And they cut out a foot of his colon, but he survived. And he made this rat rod in his recovery. He can't sell it. It's his baby. The rat rod. The Cadillac rat rod. Okay? And so, this guy's insane. He's 77. When I met him, I thought he was my age, 60. And I was just blown away. 77. If I could be like him at 77, that'd be awesome. This is like an eight-car garage. Okay? And so I saw, I talked with him. He lives right next to my brother. I went to see my brother for Christmas, and my brother said, You gotta be Ron, he's nuts. And he was great. His wife Sandy, right? She's nuts too. And so they have this really southwestern house, you know, the table thing, you know, the stucco thing, the flat roofs and the cacti and cactuses and all that kind of stuff. It's really cool. I want their house. The, uh, so the first thing when you get up shoot, you start to, you have to pre-visualize. For you folks who are in photography, have you noticed that? Uh, as you get further along in photography? So when Lisa and I were first married, we'd be going along, and Lisa would say, go take a picture of that. And I go, no. I said, why? Because I already know if I take a picture of that in that light, and that, it's not going to look good. It's, it's cool. Don't get me wrong. But with the light and everything, what's going on, it's going to suck as a photograph. Have you gotten to that point? Yeah. 
but you're pre-visualizing. But then you have to say to yourself, if I had the light right, the, the correct light on that, and the correct perspective, that would be cool, right? So the same thing happens here. Uh, there's Ron on the left, and there's my brother on the right. And we're looking at this car going, what are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? And um, up here on top, he's actually cut the roof out, and he's got some really cool stuff. The, uh, look at that, made in the USA, he's got skulls on there, Mobile, thank you Henry. Henry Ford made the car, right? Back in the 30s, right? And, uh, uh, yeah. See that? Oh, he's got German there. Vehicular misfit. Vehicular. That was kind of Americanized German, okay? And so, that's pretty cool. There's my son James, he's helping out as well. He's at Utah State University, going into photography. And uh, so we set up the camera where we wanted. The other thing that we realized, in order to see the roof, we had to tilt the car. So we got one of the floor jacks and jacked it up a little bit, about that much, okay? You can't see the jacks, so the light is good. And we decided to put Ron in the back with the grinder, okay? And um, <laughs> we just had to decide. In light painting, Everything that you see in here, you have to do it perfect. There's no do-overs. Does that make sense? So you start this process, you get the photograph the way you want it, compositionally, and you have to stick with it. Because halfway through, you can't change things up, or you just have to start over, right? This car took four and a half hours to shoot. We took 132 photographs. Okay? And... Um, Oh, by the way, your tripod has to be really, really stable. And it has to be a really nice tripod. This is a nice Bogan. Uh, my wife bought that to us, bought me this for our wedding anniversary, our second year. She worked at a hardware store. And I tell you what, I love this tripod. Because it's sentimental, I can't sell it. Okay, but it holds things steadily. And I have sandbags that I can use to keep things really, really stable. Because this thing shouldn't move throughout all of these exposures because you're going to go back in Photoshop and try to align it, right? And so I didn't have a sandbag because I flew to St. George, Utah. And so Ron says, well, do you think a piston would work? <laughs> sure, dude. We got the piston on it, and the piston starts swinging like this. They go, that's not going to work. And so we put some more stuff in it, and you know, it, after about a minute and a half, it's, it's settled down. So we, this is my piston shot. It's great. And that's actually another light tripod. She used to do this. Here's the thing. That's a Gitzo. Okay? You know Gitzo? The tripod that costs more than it should, right? That's a thousand dollar tripod. Nine hundred and ninety-nine dollars on B and H. I bought this from a guy on eBay. The small little leg was cracked. I got it for three hundred dollars. The part cost me thirty dollars. So I got an almost brand new Gitzo for $330. So as you folks are thinking about trying to go used, go used. I would say 90% of my, my photography gear, lenses and cameras and everything is used. It's all used. The, uh, so here we are. This is what it looked like. I call this the base photograph. All of these have a base photograph. And that base photograph is done with this light. And can you, okay, picture me, you probably can't picture me dancing around in this garage, right? So here we are, we're doing the front of the car like this. <laughs> and, then, and then we go to the back. And so I'm keeping it so I don't flash the camera, right? And I go back and I go this way and I go this way and I go this all the way back, right? And I do this about four times until I can get an exposure that's kind of even all the way through. This is my base, okay? So that wasn't actually how it looked in there. How it looked in there was like a dingy garage, right? With fluorescent lights. This is without the lights on. No lights are on. Okay, everything's in the dark. All these photographs are all done in the dark. I forgot to mention that. Okay, everything's in the dark. You become a mushroom when you do light painting. You do not have a suntan, okay? You get white and pasty. Stuff. Okay. So after I shot, 
this car. And you'll see this. I'll have a, I have a little movie of this. Uh, the wheels. Each wheel is about two photographs. The engine is about eight photographs. Uh, the paneling in the top of the car is about eight photographs. All in all, we've got about 46 photographs that I used in that, photo, in that photograph, okay? So you go through and you pick them and you're messing around with camera raw and blah, blah, blah. And uh, this is an example of actually doing a light paint. This is with a scram with the reflector, right? You're using it as a scram. And I have this light. And I have a broken collarbone at this time. A broken collarbone. And so my brother's helping me out a lot, okay? It's been about six weeks, so I'm doing good, all right? And uh, so, watch right here, right there, okay? So that is what we were trying to get, just that little piece right there. Not even this piece, but just the top of the air cleaner. And just, you know, just little stuff, right? And so that's where it sits. That's where it's going to sit in the final photograph. I know you can't see it from the back there. So let's go back to the workflow. We're all, we already shot it, tethered it, we modified the files in Lightroom, we individually bring those files into Photoshop for the positive, okay? Each one of these, this is, okay, any photo, got, how many Photoshoppers do we have out here, okay? Uh, this is about 70% of the layers in that photograph. There's about another 10, okay? Each one of these, is a small photograph that's used in that photograph. Does that make sense? Okay. This will make more sense. Uh, this is a very quick little video. It takes well, 58 seconds. Okay. Uh, it starts off as the base layer. Uh, do some masking to kind of keep things from going, and we start the engine starts to go. <coughs> Tailpipes, the bottom of the engine, the radiator, the two tires, the front of the tire. The side. Um, so this took me about eight hours of Photoshop. So about four and a half hours to shoot it, another eight or so to Photoshop it, and another two to cry. <laughs> I listen to Stevie Ray Vaughan while I do this. Uh, I listen to um, Bert Capra. I listen to. The monkeys, I listen to that. <laughs> classical music, yeah. There's Ron welding in the back. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. We waited that, we actually waited for that for last because what's going to happen when you weld or, or, or grind? It's going to get really smoky and nasty. Does that make sense? So we waited, okay. So that still doesn't look like that, right? Still doesn't look like that. That's where you go back into Lightroom. Now you could go into Photoshop and make it look like that, but I'll tell you, I'm tired of layers by that time. You know what I'm saying? You ever get tired of layers? Oh yeah. Even, even, yeah, even, yeah. Okay. So I have to do this. Yeah. When you put a quick time movie in these PowerPoints, you try to mess with your head. Okay. So here we are. Uh, we bring that photograph back into Lightroom, yeah. And then you come in here, you crop it, you dodge and burn, you enhance things, you, you know, use the clarity filter a little bit, you try to get some of the noise out of it, you know, all that fun stuff, okay? And then you're finished. And then you take your wife off for dinner, because she deserves it, or put it off, right? That's amazing. And um, here's the thing. I chose the title of my show, right? That light shine out of darkness on a purpose. Now, I realize this is in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, right? Uh, for God who said that light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, you good Christian people know what that means, right? It's talking about the gospel, uh, God's creation, God's love, and those things are shown through Jesus Christ, right? Now, depending on what, what Christian religion you're from, there may be slightly different interpretations of the scripture, but that's pretty much the gist of it. 
I'm an artist. So I will massacre it. Let light shine out of darkness. That's all I want to know. Right? And so here's the cool thing about it. These light paintings start in complete darkness. And you are, I'm not going to say a creator. You are a creator, right? And so you get a little bit of an essence of what God had when he created this earth. I mean, that's awesome if you really think about it, right? And you have this little minuscule little thing, and you're trying to create something you're like kind of cool and really fun out of it, which is really fun. And the nice thing about it is, is this. You can share it with others. And here's the thing. All of these images, when you look at them, everyone gets something different out of it. I get lots of different things out of these. Okay? Uh, different things come to mind. Uh, this work is really a work of love for me. Um, and it's the type of art that I really enjoy doing. Okay? Uh, it's not the type of work that I do to actually make a lot of money. Okay? But it's the stuff I really like to do, just for kicks and grins. Does that make sense? Eric Curry, you remember the guy who did the car and the airplanes and all that kind of stuff? Uh, he's retired now, but he still does two airplanes a month, and he gets about five grand a piece. What kind of retirement is that? <laughs> I'm going to talk to him. I'm going to talk to him. So, the, um, uh, now I'm at a Christian school, so I can do this. Um, I do have a testimony that God lives, that Jesus is the Christ, and that if you take time in your life, to trust in Him, His guidance, your life is going to go a whole lot better. A whole lot better. Here's the deal. There's a couple of things, well, three things that you really need to have in life. You need to have stability in your relationships. Right? You need to have stability in your finances. And you need to have stability with your relationship with God. If you can do those three things, your life is going to be a lot better, okay? In the scriptures, it talks about life is what it is, okay? Uh, Christ says what? I'm paraphrasing several scriptures, right? He says he's going to be there to help you through the hard times. He doesn't say that if you're a Christian and you live a good life, that you're going to be on easy street. Is that correct? A lot of people believe that. I don't understand. They say, did you read the Bible? No. <laughs> Basically, it says life hurts, and it really is a hard thing. But hopefully, the gospel will help you through your life and make, make it okay to get through those valleys that you go through. I have a testimony that Christ will pick you up and help you through those valleys, if you will let him. Okay? And you will have those valleys. I also tell my students at South Central this. Life is going to really reap. Okay? Make the best decisions that you can. Make the best decisions you can so that your life doesn't reek really bad. Because if you make really bad decisions, when the tough times come, it's going to be tougher. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Have a rainy day fund. Not only financially, but a rainy day fund spiritually and emotionally. You've got to have... Things banked up, banked up. Don't exhaust yourself, okay? Be ready, be ready. And doing these light paintings, uh, doing photography, doing video, doing painting, doing any of those types of things, it's going to take what? Tenacity. It's going to take an opportunity for you to learn more about yourself and also learn about God's creations. And uh, I leave you with that. And do you have any questions for me? The, the rat rod thing, I mean, that whole guy's life seems like such a great story. Have you done anything with the photograph as far as getting it published or to a magazine or something like that? The, uh, I completed it 10 days ago. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, one of the things that I am doing right now, actually, I've actually had five car buffs talk to me now. And they're like, hey, I've got a hot car, right? And Gail Bigby, my, my conspirator at South Central College, she teaches graphics, she, her husband bought, or you bought, your oh, husband, bought. you bought your husband yeah. a yellow Volkswagen, the old style stuff. 
So we got to curse with surfboards. And I'm going to get that my lifeguard team in that. Don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> It'd be great. It'd be great. I can see it. Any other questions? Now, hold on. I know the Bethany group is quiet. Because I've been to several things that the Bethany students have been to. And you know what they do? <laughs> you guys are nice. <laughs> now, I've got some South Central students who are pretty rowdy. But yeah. <laughs> but, they, but they've been rowdy out. This has already been the first week of class. We're all done being rowdy. You know, they've already been all over my case. What's that? What happened? <laughs> yes? Is this your first exhibit type show, or is this something that you've done before oh. with other types? Oh, sure. The, um, yeah, I've had several other exhibits, you know, different types of photography. Um, just go to my Flickr site. My Flickr site is not my portfolio. As a matter of fact, my actual portfolio site is sad because I haven't updated it in six years. Okay. I teach. I don't do anything. All right, South Central College students. I don't have time. I don't have time to do anything. The, um, so if you go to my Flickr site, it's flickr.com. They spell it wrong, right? F-L-I-C-K-R dot com, then go slash Wes Taylor, right? And uh, you'll see that, let's see, um, I go to the track a lot and uh, do a lot of betting, and it's really fun. No, I don't do that. Uh, my wife wouldn't let me, but it'd be a lot of fun. The, the, uh, as a matter of fact, I went there with this, my students. We were at a, a national competition for Skills USA, and my students were betting on this stuff. You know, and one student who knew nothing about gambling was actually winning. And it was great. <laughs> it was, I think I'll say you so, But the cool thing about it is that this horse and this horse, their, their hooves are even on the ground. That's kind of cool. That's, just, that's the finish line at Churchill Downs at one of the races. And then there's some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is my grandfather's scissors. And uh, he actually welded on there to fix it. Uh, Tyler, you're here. There you are, dude. <laughs> Dan Smith, you guys know Dan Smith, one of our students, right? He looks so erudite right there. Okay. And uh, the old egg and the egg basket trick. There's Eli, yeah, crazy Eli from South Central. Man. And leaves and rocks and typewriters and the Mankato Symphony and my bike. I haven't wrecked on this bike, life is good. Um, it's a good bike. Goats, I like goats. I decided out cars. This is a stupid car. It wasn't photoshopped. It was not photoshopped. I like seeing people get tattoos. I think it's, it's interesting. I don't have a tat. Biking. Now this was another. I did a show on this motion parallax, uh, where you take photographs out of the side of your car. Someone else is driving, by the way. Uh, <laughs> it's not. It's worse than texting. <laughs> No, the motion parallax is kind of cool, all right? Um, it's really weird stuff. Ah, I hate this. I got, I got this new mattress the other day. It's got that big tra track pad. Oh, yeah. All right. So, uh, think about it. Uh, so, you're, you're riding along in the car, and you look to the side, and you look at the soybean field, right? And you notice they've got the rows, right? And you notice that there's a little part in there that always seems to be in focus, right? And the rest of it's really blurry. That's motion parallax. And so what you do is you set your camera at one thirtieth of a second, and you just sit there and take photographs of it that way. And you get this weird stuff. Weird stuff. Now, I pick stuff that's really bizarre. You, you, have you noticed that? I see. So the light painting, that this, is, this type of light painting, I only know of five light photographers that do this, that really do this. I know a few. I know dozens that try, and they do one or two, and then they give up. It's awesome. Does that make sense? And so you have to be obsessed. I, I talked about it being obsessed. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right. Obsessed, obsessed, obsessed. And so I was obsessed with this for a while. My wife drove for me a lot, and I had to take her out to dinner a lot. And uh, yeah, I mean, guys on bike, it's just weird stuff, man. I mean, just. Like this, this, she's going to the vortex with her doggies. <laughs> this is kind of cool. Now look at this one. All right, this 
this photograph, I looked at the timestamp. About, about a, one twentieth of a second between this photograph and this photograph. Guy walking the dog. Actually, it's the three-legged dog. No, it's the two-and-a-half-legged dog. <laughs> That's weird. That's weird. Right? I mean, it's just weird stuff. It's just weird. And these look really weird as prints. Uh, we've got some of these in our home that are like, like this one right here. I've got this one that's like, how big is it? It's seven feet, seven feet long. It's really cool. It's really cool. It's really cool. But anyway, llamas. I have llamas. And you know, it's just bizarre stuff. But after a while, you get seasick, right? I like this one. I call this from the burning bush. You know, there's a burning bush. That was it, right? And um, so. Anyway, good question. But no, I've had several gallery shows and whatnot. Matter of fact, when I was a student at Utah State University, I had one of my prints bought by the museum there. And uh, back in the day, maybe medium format cameras, they had the square, you know. And what I did is I did a contact sheet. You know, I do a contact sheet with those, and 11 by 14, it has these 12 squares in it, right? And they said, what was it? I took your white sheet, Threw it on the grass, and our neighbor had a black cat. A little kitten, right? Threw it on there, and I took pictures of this cat doing all this you know, sexy moves. <laughs> and then I crossed his eyes out in the contact sheet, right? And I call it kitty porn. <laughs> and I did it to mock my friends who were all into, you know what they were into, right? <laughs> And I did it to mock my artist friends who were into nudes on you know, the rocks and stuff like that. And uh, I thought it was hilarious, right? And the museum loved it. They bought it. I can't believe it. It's in the permanent collection. I don't know. And I was mocking the art department. I don't understand. Uh, but anyway, that's... Okay. The um, cameras. How much time we got, though? Two seconds? Two seconds. Two seconds. Um, the camera I'm using here is a Fuji GFX. It is a medium format camera. It does have a little bit bigger sensor. Okay? You can do these with uh, a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. You don't have to have a big gun like that one. Does that make sense? Okay. I hope that you art students will be obsessed with your art and that you'll be obsessed with making a difference in the world. That's my hope and prayer that you do that. So do it. Thanks, Bill.